Good morning. Good morning. Woo! <laughs> Everybody, welcome to our third DevNet Create. <laughs> so I want to thank you all for being here because, uh, well, actually, how many of you have been to DevNet Create before? Awesome. Good job, guys. And how many is it your first time at DevNet Create? Wow. Amazing. So I want to thank you all because what you know is that DevNet Create is for all of you. So the DevNet team re really put our developers first. A core mission of DevNet is to ensure that our developers are successful in their lives and in their careers and in their businesses. And so the fact that you are all here with us and part of our community is really amazing and I'm just thankful that you've all chosen to be here. DevNet Create is a community conference. And the talks are from both DevNet and Cisco team members, but many are from our community. So first, I want to thank our speakers. Are our speakers here? All the speakers, OK. Stand up, speakers. Stand up, speakers. Your lights, you're all lit up there. You see our speakers? Excellent. They've put together an amazing set of content for all of you. Last night, we had the speaker dinner, so I talked to many of them. Many of them are a little nervous, are very excited. Some of them have taken chances in the type of talk that they're giving. And I think that we had a really great selection process. They're going to be amazing talks and workshops for all of you to, to, to attend. Uh, next is that some of you are here for the first time today, but some of you have been coding since yesterday. Where's our camp creators and IoT builders? Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Stand up, come on. Excellent. So these folks have been hands-on with our API since yesterday. I'm sure you guys are feeling really good right now, you know? <laughs> they're in that kind of in the middle of what they're hacking and coding up together, and we'll see the results of them over the next couple days. And then most of all, I just want to thank all of you. So thank you all, our community. Let's hear it all for you. And uh, one of the things that we do, and the things that I love about our developers, is that for all of you, whether you're new to coding, whether you've been coding for a long time, whether you're looking for a new job, whether you're a student, whether you're trying to pivot your careers, everyone is learning new things. And in DevNet, we say, learn, code, inspire, and connect. So learn is all of the new things that we're learning about, including the new technologies that we're going to be talking about. Code, get hands-on. Everything that we do is hands-on so that you can get hands-on, get practice, go forward with what you do. Inspire, it's for you to get inspiration from each other to see what's that next big thing that I can go out for and connect. It's most of all about how you all connect with each other. I promise you that if you come to DevNet Create and you meet new people who you will stay in touch with after this, other people who are attending, other people who have been in the DevNet community, others who are new in the DevNet community, people from my team, me, the more people that you meet, the better experience that you're going to have out of this. And so we welcome everybody of all levels, and I hope that this becomes your community and that you all meet people and feel welcome and at home so that together we can continue to build the future. And DevNet, since last year, we've actually hit an interesting milestone, is we actually hit half a million members in our community. And we had a little party. And uh, we're actually up to 500, more than 585,000 members now. And once again, it's for all of you and all of the work that you are putting into this. So now what I'm going to do is that we're going to open up. Mandy and I are going to give the first part of an opening keynote. After that, Todd Nightingale is going to come up. SVP and GM of Meraki, and we're going to go through some new technologies and then go through some other goodies at the end. So first of all, let's take a look at the opportunity that we all have in front of us. So the opportunity is that we know that there's infrastructure, your network, your compute, the different architectures. There's so much that can happen in the infrastructure. And then there's the set of applications that work on top of that infrastructure. 
and hopefully work with the infrastructure. And through those applications, what we're doing is driving business outcomes. And the more that we can work together to understand the opportunities in the infrastructure, the opportunities for our app developers, and the opportunities for business outcomes, the better result that we can have. And DevNet Create is about bringing all three of these together, the business outcomes, the applications, and the infrastructure. And if you take a look historically, then what we see is that every time there's been an advancement in the infrastructure, have come a whole new class of applications that have changed business. So first, some of you might remember, there was a time when we first got to converged IP networks, where networks could do data and voice together. And then for the first time, we had voice over IP. Then came cloud computing, and along with cloud computing came the ability to do internet search. Does anybody remember before that existed? Or is that just me? Anyway, don't answer that. And then came CDNs, content delivery networks, so you could cache content at the edge. And then came the whole world of video streaming along with that. Then we got 3G. Remember when mobile phones were only phones and they couldn't do apps, right? But along with 3G came mobile apps and the smartphones. And then with 4G came mobile video. I don't even know if they have mobile phones that don't have cameras and video capabilities these days. So there have been all of these huge advancements in the infrastructure that have had leaps in applications. And what we're talking about here at Create is that we're not done with advances in the infrastructure. There is a whole new set of advancements that we're going to be talking about today that provide tremendous opportunity for developers. So the first is network advances in Wi-Fi 6 and 5G. Networking is going to change, and we'll be talking about that today. Compute advances is that GPUs are now everywhere, and that enables that whole world of AI and machine learning, everything that we've dreamed that we've wanted to do, now becomes possible because of these advances in compute. And then there's architectural advances, where architecturally, we were great to move into cloud, to move to mobile, but now there's a world of edge computing that's becoming a reality and becoming an opportunity for developers. So let's take a look. So with each, of these, uh, with each of these advances in infrastructure technologies come new capabilities. You can do things with AR, VR, video, AI and machine learning, IoT applications. And the question is, with all of these capabilities, what will you and what will we together as a community create? And when we think about the new things that we can create together, we can think of them in a few areas. So first of all, create great experiences create great experiences for end users, customers, for operators of the systems that people are using, and do those to solve business problems. And that's really key when we're making applications that can solve business problems. The next is make sure that you build your application so that you're maximizing intelligence with every interaction. Every time someone touches something, figure out how to turn that into intelligence and process that. And that's not easy to do, actually. You have to think about how you build that into your applications. And then make an infrastructure so that you can continuously deploy innovative applications. Because developers like you are constantly innovating, the next great innovation and application may come in the next one or two or three years. So you want to build in a way that you can continue to deploy those innovations. And you can do all this by building a programmable infrastructure. A programmable infrastructure that lets you build in intelligence, continuously deploy applications, and then build these great experiences that give you business relevance. So the vision is that we want to empower developers with this programmable infrastructure where they can write once, deploy to places you couldn't even dream you could deploy to, and run it everywhere. And so if we take a look at the stack, what that means is that our infrastructure is now a programmable infrastructure. On top of that, you have infrastructure services. You can actually use the infrastructure to help you connect and compute in new ways. And then you have application services so you can continue to deploy new applications onto this infrastructure. And as we get into this loop with the full stack, that's when we'll be operating at full power with all of the capabilities in front of us. And what do I mean by a programmable infrastructure? There's a programmable network. It uses cloud and edge computing. It even connects to physical environments. 
even your lanyards that are lighting up, right? Buildings, machinery, everything. That all counts in the programmable infrastructure that developers can use. In the infrastructure services, we have intent-based networking so that networks are able to operate at an entirely new level and not just provide connectivity. Security, analytics can all be built into infrastructure capabilities. And then for the applications, we have things like DevOps, CICD, architecting applications with containers and microservices, and having the data services. And all this provides an incredible toolbox for the great new set of applications that can be built. And through this, Cisco has a number of products that are at all levels of the stack. And the way that we fully use the programmability at every layer is how we can empower this new set of applications to be written by our application developers. And so that's really what we're working for at DevNet Create. So now, let's take a look at this first set. So network advances. Who knows about Wi-Fi 6? Nice. And some are new. And 5G. So what happens is we have a whole new level of connectivity in front of us. And I'm going to geek out a minute to talk about Wi-Fi 6. Um, so today's Wi-Fi, 802.11ac. The new version that's coming is 802.11ax. And we're going to just call it Wi-Fi 6. Is that OK? <laughs> so. Now, with this, you always think Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi. Can I count on Wi-Fi? What can I do with it? Right? And you tend to write your applications for what you think the Wi-Fi is going to be able to provide. There's actually a number of technology advances that are coming in Wi-Fi 6 that really make it different and a huge advancement for developers. So first one, OFDMA. We're moving from OFDM to OFDMA, orthogonal frequency division, multiple access. Um, so, what are the advantages? Currently, when you use OFDM, you talk, you transmit. So, at one point in time, you send out a signal, and then all of the devices hear that one signal, but you're talking to one device at a time, okay? Because you're sending for one device. But with OFDMA, you can actually split up the frequency and now talk to different people at the same time. You can actually send multiple signals at the same time to different clients. So, with that, you're doing much better use of your spectrum, so you get higher capacity in the bandwidth that you can send. And then you can also do simultaneous transmissions, which actually means that you can serve multiple people better. Next, there's something, something called uh, carrier sense multiple access, which is where you do this listen before you talk with today's client. So they listen, there's nobody talking, now I can send my signal. But this is moving to scheduling, where actually, the clients and the access points, they decide and they schedule and they get slots when they can talk to each other. That makes it much more efficient. You're not just bumping into collisions, but you're actually scheduling what you can do. And when you combine this with OFDMA, you actually get a much higher density of users and devices that you can support. We could support everybody in this room, even if you have multiple devices together. And then you can have deterministic scheduling so you know when somebody can get a signal. And that provides a new level of reliability to Wi-Fi that we haven't seen before. And then there's something called target wake-up times, where before, a device always had to listen for their chance. But instead, what you can do is go to a device and say, sleep, 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 and then wake up at the right time. Sleep, 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 wake up at the right time. And this means that your devices, like IoT devices, sensors, they can really rest and then get much longer battery life because they can turn on when they're supposed to. So there's a whole new set of IoT applications that you can build with this just because the sensors can be much more efficient and the devices can be much more efficient. And then what we've done is we've actually tried this out in the lab. So the products will be coming. And if you take a look at Wi-Fi 6, here's a side-by-side -side where we have a Wi-Fi 6 access point talking to Wi-Fi 6 clients. And what you see here is that we've test driven this in our lab with, once again, real access points and real clients. And here what we have is the speed test. So this is just using the speed test with the access points and the clients. We're looking at 4K video and just sending this. And what you see is with the speed test alone, 45 megabits per second versus 139 for the downloads. It's better, better performance. 68, 69 versus 215 uplink in upload performance. You guys like that? 
And so if we take a look, then we take a look at this video, having a little bit of trouble sending this high quality video through. But when we use Wi-Fi 6, then we can fully stream the video at its full quality. So you can see where you can take 4K video, just the threshold is changing for the types of applications that you can build, and we can get entirely better performance. Is that exciting? Yeah. And so what happens is that just shows the performance alone. But once again, with the higher density, you can actually serve crowds like this. And once again, crowds of people that have multiple devices because of that higher capacity and the technologies I just told you about. And then what I can definitively say is that Wi-Fi 6 is for developers. And you need to be thinking about the applications that you can build with this capability that's going to be deployed over the next one, two years. And right here, you can be the first to test drive Wi-Fi 6 here at DevNet Create. We actually have a Wi-Fi 6 access point around the corner, and then we have some devices, so you'll be able to work here with Ashutosh. Raise your hand here. And he will be showing you Wi-Fi 6. So get hands on with it first here at DevNet Create. <laughs> Okay, next, let's take a look at some compute advances. So with compute advances, we have GPUs for AI and ML. And the thing is that GPUs are everywhere. And so all of those dreams of you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, we've had so many hopes for this, and they just become more possible to do because of the advances in compute. And it gets so easy, it will even go to your mobile devices and your laptops. And this is just showing that we actually built a machine learning app in a browser using tensorflow.js. Five lines of code. Abu, where's Abu? Oh, he's out working. He developed, oh, there he is, back in the corner, Abu. So, <laughs> and he built a web app, a machine learning web app using tensorflow.js. It's detecting bottles, it's detecting people, right? And what this is doing is using WebGL in the browser to access the device GPU. So, by actually now, you can have your web apps. You can just write JavaScript through a browser, use tensorflow.js, and then what happens is it accesses the device sensors because you can have a mobile browser on your devices. And by the way, your devices all have GPUs in them now. The data can stay on the client. If you're using camera from the client, processing it with the GPU, sending it out with this app that you write. What's nice is when you use this model, it's cross-device, cross-platform, cross-OS because you're using the browser. And then you can just, again, use these libraries to just learn about machine learning and AI just by using the libraries that are available to you. Decide what you want to prototype and build proof of concepts of, and then decide what you want to move to production. So great new tool that empowers developers in a great new way. So next, let's take a look at some of the architectural advances. So, oh, and uh, I'm sorry. And then Abu will have a workshop on this today at 11.45, workshop three, and he'll show you what he's built here and then show you how to do that yourself. So next, let's take a look at the architectural advances that we can get to with edge computing. Now, you can think, why do we need edge computing? So there's application areas like manufacturing. Manufacturing, you have high performance machinery that's connected and needs to operate fast. That's not a time that you want to be sending data up to the cloud, making a decision, bringing it back to decide what your machine should do. So with manufacturing, you have low latency and high performance requirements to keep these systems running. That's an opportunity for edge computing. Retail, stores, you have stores, and then you have stores that are just all over the place, you know, geographically distributed in separate physical locations. You don't want those stores to go down. You want them to work independently, connect where they need to. So a big use, especially as you're bringing more intelligence into your stores, looking at scan and go applications, everything there, you want to have that independence, so it's an opportunity for edge computing, as well as connect to the cloud and the rest of the data when you need to. Utilities, right? Utilities are, there's brownfield, there's existing brownfield and physical systems that are out there. And as those connect, you want to connect them and you want to bring those up to speed with all the digital technologies, but another opportunity for edge computing and how you connect those and bring the power of application development to them. In transportation in cities, 
when you have trains, when you have cars, streets, buildings, you have a physically distributed and mobile infrastructure. And so that's another area where edge computing comes into play. And so the idea of edge computing is not new, but to be developing those edge computing applications, they're like, what's been the problem? Well, we haven't had the edge computing infrastructure that a developer could access. But once you actually do have that edge computing infrastructure where you can have a place to put your applications, you can actually unlock the cycle of building edge computing applications on this infrastructure. And that's really what we're looking at is the whole loop of writing edge computing applications with the infrastructure. And Cisco has a number of products in all layers of the stack that are not only letting you deploy networking connect uh, connections and networking connectivity to the edge, because it is all about connecting things, but also hosting applications at the edge so that you have that spot where a developer can drop their apps, right? And that's what opens this up to all of you. So for example, think about a police car. Did you ever think of that as an edge computing opportunity? When you take a look at this, what happens is that the police car is actually a mobile office. It has an access point, dashboard cameras, laptops, tablets, they need to connect up to their systems. So there's a set of infrastructure, there's a gateway, and then connectivity in which you can actually deploy and manage those gateways and deploy and manage applications to that infrastructure. And with that, you get the full loop of being able to develop applications that can go out into this world because of what we can do with edge computing today. And something that we're gonna do here at DevNet Create is that in January, we announced the new Cisco IoT Edge Gateway, and it is the uh, IR 1101. It's actually the bottom box there. That can go in a police car. That can go up on a telephone pole. That can go out into really industrial settings. But it also has an ability to host applications. Now, what we've done is build a prototype of putting GPUs on top of it, so that not only can you run an application on there, but you could also do some machine learning using a GPU with this prototype add-on that's on the top. So here what we have is a GPU extension module using the NVIDIA Jetson for AI and ML processing. It's a proof of concept we made for DevNet Create. We can run containers at the edge, and we're using K3S so that you can actually deploy some of your machine learning as well as your containers at the edge across both of these devices, and then use all of the compute. And what we've done is we have a set of folks who've been hacking on this. And what we want to do is invite our community, all of you here at DevNet Create, to build applications on this. Give us your ideas. Do you have ideas that you want to turn into business? Do you want to use this? And as we see what you have, we're going to make the decision on how we productize this and how we bring it to market. But it's going to be based on feedback from all of you from the community. You guys ready to hack on it? And I want to, Ashutosh, you can raise your hand. He's at the center of this. And tomorrow, he's going to be giving, or sorry, today at 4.30, he'll have his session on this. And we have a set of developers who've actually been developing on this for the last day. And so they are working on this. And I know that they're working through it, giving us the feedback. There's parts that work great, parts that we need to improve. But it's all about getting that feedback so we can build it into what you all need. OK, so if you take all of these things together, what happens is we have a new opportunity for developers. When you take a look at what we can do with these infrastructure advances and technologies, you can now bring applications like this to life, to where you actually have your machinery, where you're in a manufacturing plant, bring up your AR, VR, right? Take a look, see what it is, connect into the data that you need. These things become a reality because of the network connectivity, the compute processing, as well as the different architectures that come into play. You can take a look at new ways to educate, where you give students individual lessons in how they can actually view with AR and VR their projects so they can learn in the way that they want to learn and take care of these very busy, busy environments because of the new advances in architecture. So next, what we want to do is that we have in DevNet a see it, learn it, code it. So again, very hands-on approach. And what we're going to do is take a look at you as a developer getting asked to help a band as it works on three different types of venues. So one is they're playing in a college campus. How can they get set up to play in that college campus? What happens when you want to go to an outdoor festival 
and what you can do there and what happens when you get into a stadium with everything you want to do there. So Mandy Whaley is going to come up and walk us through some demos with the team. Mandy. Great. Thank you so much. Hello. Welcome everyone to DevNet Create. As Susie said, we like to take this opportunity to do our see it, learn it, code it, where we show you a, a use case, something that you might get some inspiration from it, and then we show you how you can learn about it using DevNet resources and how you can build something similar using those resources. So we're going to take it through this progression of the small venue, the big festival scene, and then the gigantic stadium. And we're going to look at some of the new opportunities that Susie was discussing earlier that are opened up for developers, how we can help solve problems that happen in all of these three physical spaces. So the first one we're going to take a look at is that small college club. And we want to get connectivity up. We want our audience to be able to connect. We also want it to be secure. But we probably don't have a huge staff to set this up. Um, so we want to look at how we can use Cisco Meraki and Umbrella together to really quickly and efficiently bring up a network and also secure it. So we're just going to start in the Meraki dashboard. And we'll see we have a network that exists there, but we need to enable the SSID and the settings. And what we're going to see is that we can do this by just making a couple API calls. So you can see right now, not a lot is set up. There's no captive portal. There's no splash page. It doesn't require a password. We don't have the actual URL for our splash page specified. But now we're going to take a look at how we can do that using APIs. So we're going to make two API calls, one to set up the SSID set some of the um, configuration settings that we want, like how we want people to log in, that we will have a captive portal. We're going to make that call. We got back 200 OK. That's always a good sign. And now we're going to make one more call to actually specify the splash page URL. We got our 200 OK. We're going to head back to that Meragi dashboard. And we can see that the splash page settings are updated. Our captive portal is going to be um, enabled. And then we also are now requiring people to log in. And we have all of our um, SSID settings set with just those two API calls. And you can learn how to do those on DevNet. Now we're seeing that in action. Someone's logging in. They've got the captive portal. They got our custom splash page. And they're going to log in and get started. And these are all things you can try out today in the Meraki challenge that's going on out in the, in the Great Hall. Now we may want to go a step further. And we may want to introduce some content filtering. So initially, there's no content filtering enabled. But this is also something we can do easily with one API call. So we're going to um, make one API call. We're going to set it up to block travel sites, as an example. We can see it's, it's now blocked from that one API call. We try to go to Trivago. We can't get to it. We've, we've blocked that kind of content. So this is a really great example showing how, with a few API calls that you can learn, you're able to do some really powerful things with Meraki. We want to go a step further, and we want to say even farther, how can we secure the network? How can we secure it for every user just in minutes? And this is where Meraki pairs really well with Cisco Umbrella. Cisco Umbrella is also a cloud service, and it's really great for doing DNS filtering. So most ransomware attacks, they make a, a callback. They use DNS to call back and get information to you for the command and control that they're doing. And so if we are able to filter at DNS, we can stop a lot of this ransomware from taking the malicious action it's trying to take. And this is where Umbrella comes in, and it makes it very easy to do this. And I want to show you how you can integrate this with Meraki. So we're back in our Meraki dashboard. We're going to apply our Umbrella API keys right in the dashboard. Now we're connecting those two things together. We're able to import policy from Umbrella. We'll see that come in. And you can see that we, um, we're importing our Umbrella policies. We're setting that up, choosing our DevNet Create one that we've configured. And we can see that we're starting to fetch that configuration and starting to apply those policies. So if you wanted to block like social media or something like that, you can set that up. And then um, you can see, here's an example of what it looks like when someone tries to access that URL that you are blocking. 
So um, that's a great example, and I think it really shows how you can bring two things together, Meraki and Umbrella. You can learn about all these resources on DevNet. We have a Meraki learning track. We have code ex uh, samples in DevNet Code Exchange where you can actually try out these APIs and um, build something pretty similar. OK, so next, our next physical space. We want to go to a large outdoor festival. So everybody take a minute. Imagine it's a beautiful day like it is today, right now. You're outside, you're in a festival, there's great music going on. And we want to think about how we as a developer using programmable infrastructure can make this experience for our attendees the best that it can be. So we have a lot of people. It's a big crowd all in one place. And we need a really robust, robust and um, well-performing network. So I'd like to introduce Ashutosh. He leads our co-creations team. And they have recently built an augmented reality application that's built on top of Cisco DNA Center. And what it allows you to do is an engineer to be in the field and actually get wireless health information using an augmented reality application. Yeah, if you can actually yep. get the next slide. Actually, there's one more slide. Ah, one more so, slide. The, so one of the things that uh, we wanted to show here is like there is like what we call as a DNA Center. And the DNA Center has visibility to the network. And we wanted to show how, like, you know, we talk about, like, uh, you know, infrastructure meet applications. This is a very good example of showing that, that as an app developer, what you could be doing is you could be building AR experiences with the, the networking gear that, uh, that's out there. Yes. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you, like, uh, a couple of things. Uh, the first thing is that... You switch, yeah. Yep. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to do is I am a network engineer. And I've been told, like, hey, there is a problem with the Wi-Fi. Uh, can you go, or I've just deployed a new network. Can I go figure out uh, what does the network connectivity look like? Uh, and so when I. So what are you holding there? Hold it up so everybody can so, see. So this, yeah. is, this is my phone. I mean, okay. I am a network engineer. I'm bringing up my Android phone. I walk into the room. And the first thing that I do is I would basically go in and say, show me the list of access points. So what this is doing is it is going to like the DNA center, it is getting the data, it is also doing location services, it's getting that data. But, and, and it's showing me the list of APs that are around me. So that's the first thing that happens. The second thing that happens is that I'm actually going to do like locate APs. So in this case, what I'm going to do is it's not only telling me that the there. AP is, this is the list of APs, but it is also telling me the list, uh, the direction where the APs are. So as a, it's so intuitive because now as an engineer, I know that, OK, AP 25, I need to go in this direction. Or AP 15, I need to go in this direction. So that's the second one. That's very cool. And the third one is like basically I want to like track an AP. So Mandy, if you can hold up this AP for me. Yes. Absolutely. And let's hope the guards, uh, the demo gods, uh, are, are happy. smiling on us. They, yes, they are. So, so what what you see here is that I am pulling data from. So, first thing that happened is that this AR app detected that this is an AP. Once it detected an AP, what I'm doing is I clicked on the first tab, and it's getting the static information about the AP. So it's giving me like the serial number of the AP. It's telling me the IP address. It's telling me like you know what software version it is running. Everything from the DNA center. The second thing is the dynamic information. And what this dynamic information is telling you is like tell me the SSIDs that are up there, uh, or like tell me whether the the antennas have been turned on or not. Because one of the problems that people face is that there are four antennas, but sometimes because of config errors, only three of them are on. So there are those kind of case, use cases. And you could also like actually change the, the transmit levels of the signal from the app. So you could actually just do plus, minus, and the, app, the signal That's will go up and down. The third part is even more cooler. OK? So this, this is something that you know, we all wish we had at home, right? You know, like we, we have yes. Wi-Fi. And what you are able to see is the signal strength of the, the AP. So what we do is we also like you know look at uh, there are like you know published uh, signal strengths which are the theoretical numbers and these are the practical numbers so we did machine learning algorithms to actually make sure that we can portray them in uh, the 3D space so what you see here is that I'm actually showing like how it is like propagating in in the space 
And one of the other things is that we will be able to like also get different models based on like you know whether I want to see if there is like uh, 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 images. I mean, the basically signal that is bouncing and showing up, right? Mm -hmm. So basically, that's how we wanted to show this uh, application. Excellent. So, Thank you. <laughs> Woo! Awesome. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. I don't think I've ever held an AP on stage before, so that was pretty cool. Um, or been an AP holder before. Um, so yes, so this was built using a DNA Center underneath, calling those APIs. And you, we have very rich resources on DNA Center on DevNet. We have learning tracks, we have sample code, we have our sandbox. I think we have about eight different DNA Center sandboxes available on DevNet. Those are hosted labs. You can log in. You can try it for free. You can start calling the APIs that are um, used in this application. OK, so now we're still back in our field. Uh, but this time, I want to think about, with the power of Wi-Fi 6 plus IoT sensors, what can we do to improve that attendee experience out in the field? So maybe we can use IoT data to have shorter concession lines. Maybe we can improve traffic flow of the people at the conference, at the, at the festival. Maybe we can improve traffic flow of people leaving the festival. That's always really complicated. Um, and so I'd like to invite up Jock Reed. He's a developer advocate focused on IoT. And he brought with him um, like a huge case of IoT sensors and edge routers with edge compute. And it's all available out in the hall, and you can try it out. But I asked him to bring a couple to stage and uh, so we can look at a few things. So what have you got over there, Jock? OK, so first I have a, a light sensor. Um, oh, I mean, it was <laughs> earlier. Maybe it's not now. Oh, OK, good. All right. That'll show me. Also ready for the final plug. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to come up. There's a dashboard here in a second. There it is. Okay, perfect. All right, great. So I have a light sensor right here, which um, which you can use for a few things. So like at a festival, you have drinks. You're serving drinks to your patrons, and you have people pulling stuff off the shelf. If that all of a sudden runs out, you uh -huh. Get a little message that says, oh, look, maybe I need some more beer down there, and I can use that. And so it's <laughs> communicating that back to the people who need to actually stock that. Um, there's also a sensor for pressure, which is, can be used for doors, which um, you can tell how many times a door or a gate or something so can open. That could be a gate yeah, or so, something, right. So it could, be, it could be important for something like a porta potty there. If you want to say <laughs> how many times this thing's been open and closed, Maybe I need to send someone to go clean it up to make sure that my patrons are having a good experience. That is festival. important for busy festivals, for sure. Yes, <laughs> so, um, and we have these sensors here, and they are connected back to the network over Wi-Fi. Okay, so I'm envisioning at our at our festival, like in Aust I'm from Austin, as yep. are you. So two Austinites. We have some pretty big music festivals in Austin. You may have heard of a couple of them, um, and. Um, they get really crowded. So I'm envisioning if we had this scenario, we would have literally thousands of devices out in the field. Mm -hmm. And I have some questions based on that. Sure. So can Wi-Fi really support that density of devices? With Wi-Fi 6, yes. So Wi-Fi 6 standard allows for four times as many devices as previous. Wow, four times. Yeah, so it's, it's tailor-made to support IoT. So that way you can put more devices on Wi-Fi and then control it back through the network. Excellent. And then my other question that comes into my mind is, I've got all those devices out there. What about the battery life in all of those? How often do I have to change the battery in thousands of devices? Yeah, it's a good question. So with the new target wake, wake time standard, you basically can have devices that can last for years, maybe depending on the use case in the scenario, over a decade. Over a decade. Wow. And then my other question is, all those devices out in my field managing all kinds of different data, that's a lot of data coming in. Are you, how are you managing all of that data? So we're managing that through IOX and Kinetic. We have applications that are running on the edge on our IoT device. And so, so this is that ruggedized one we saw yeah. the picture of earlier, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, same kind of thing you'd see in police cars, that kind of thing. And so we're able to. Um, all the data is sent directly to those applications, and those applications are producing the dashboard. They're um, filtering how, data even back to the cloud to sync back up. How do I get my application onto that device? So 
through Kinetic, you can deploy through the cloud. And so these applications are running right here. We have a broker application that's deployed here. That's what's actually receiving the information from the sensors. And then we have the application which is processing the um, web so you can see the dashboard or it's sending data back to Spark. What does it look like to package one of those applications to be able to deploy it? So we use uh, Docker to be able to do that. We use uh, Docker tooling, Docker applications just to be able to package it up really small, really neatly, and then distribute that back over through the Kinetic Cloud. Awesome. Thank you so much. Cool. Yeah. Great job. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> thank you. So by using the power of Wi-Fi 6, we can handle more IoT devices. We can combine that with IOX, which allows us to deploy to the edge easily, and Kinetic to help manage the data and manage those deployments. Uh, we have IOX in our DevNet sandboxes. So if you want to try building a Docker application, building a container, and pushing it out to the edge using Kinetic, you can do that in our sandbox. And um, we also have learning labs and some great videos to help walk you through that as well. OK, so now we are graduating up to the giant stadium. We're at a football game in Barcelona. We're at a huge stadium concert, something like that. And what I want to look at here is the possibilities that combining AI, ML with video opens up in this stadium scenario. I want to welcome John McDonough to the stage to talk about this one. <clears throat> John is a hello. John is a developer advocate on our team, and he focuses on um, UC and data center compute and automation. You got it. Thanks, All right. Mandy. You want to click? Uh, OK. I'll click. Go ahead. OK. <laughs> All right, so I have a question here for you, Mandy. There's a red square up on the screen on this picture. Yes. Something's happening there. What do you think it is? Hmm. People getting popcorn? <laughs> <laughs> People getting popcorn, you know, seeing Milling a friend around. or something. Yeah. There's actually a fight happening there. What? And do you the, guys see a fight happening? You guys there? see a fight? Yeah. You do? Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, you're better than us, but I'm envisioning a security guard or some some personnel there that they Small can't screen. see the fight. Small screen, um, but with machine learning, it enables us to see what's undetectable. It's able us to see what's indistinguishable. So we have a short video here to show you how this is working. OK. All right. So this is actually created by Patriot One, which is a um, partner of Cisco's. And this was developed by the Cisco Co-Innovation Center in Toronto. But the fight's happening. Machine learning sees the fight. So now we see that the fight's actually taking place there. Security is dispatched. And in a few moments, security will start working over, uh, walking over there to break up the fight and, and manage what's going on there. But what's great about this, we're actually doing some edge processing with uh, the Cisco C220, C220 and C240. And then we're also doing the machine learning and modeling with the Cisco C480 ML on oh, the back end. Fantastic. All right. Thank All right. you very much. You're welcome. So um, see it, learn it, code it. We saw that amazing use case of detecting the fight that you know, some of us couldn't see. And then um, we have learning labs that can help you get started with machine learning, start teaching you about basic things like starting to do classification, um, some data sets you can try things out with. And then in our sandbox, we actually have the new Cisco UCS C40 ML. This is a new server. It has eight NVIDIA GPUs in it. And we're making this available to you, this really valuable, amazing server, free to you in the sandbox. You can reserve it. You can try it out. You can have your own place to experience that. OK. So thanks for coming along on this see it, learn it, code it journey. You can do more of that you know, out in all the hands-on activities. Just to recap, we started out in that small venue. We used Cisco Meraki and Cisco Umbrella to set up a secure network really simply with a couple API calls. In our big, large field festival, we used IoT, Wi-Fi 6, and DNA Center to make sure we had a really great environment for the attendees. And then in the big stadium, we combined AI, ML, and video to keep everybody safe. So I'd like to welcome Susie back to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mandy. <laughs> All right. Good job. Yeah. Excellent. OK, so I hope you, did you get a feel for the opportunities that we all have as developers and some of the great things that we can create? And now what we have is on DevNet, we have a number of resources that allow you to get online, 
get hands-on in that see it, learn it, code it style. So if you go to developer.cisco.com, some of the things that you'll see is you'll see our IoT Developer Center, where you can get hands-on with those technologies at developer.cisco.com slash IoT. For security, we talked about the built-in security that you can get using some of the tremendous technologies that we have. Developer.cisco.com slash security gives you the resources to learn about and get hands-on and code with all of those as well. And then you heard about DNA Center, and what we have is at developer.cisco.com slash DNA Center, you can look at some of the technologies and get, once again, get hands-on and use them right out of the box. Now, something that's really exciting is that last year, for those who are here, we actually announced something new that we created, which was DevNet Code Exchange. Code Exchange is simply a place of getting curated software from GitHub that works together with the different products and APIs that we have. And so as you look at a lot of the code, you heard a lot of reference to Code Exchange because code is out there. This is code that's written by you from our community, that's written by our product teams, that's written by different folks, but we'll curate it to make sure it has the right licenses and everything that you can use. And they said, okay, how many lines of code does the best developer write a day? How many lines of code does a great developer write a day? 100, 200, 300, my guy said it's not 1,000. Um, but someone else said zero because they know where to get the code. So you can go to Code Exchange to get the code. And since we announced it last year, we have over 400 projects listed in Code Exchange, written by both Cisco as well as by the community. So thank you all. <laughs> and in addition, as you write more applications that become successful, we have Ecosystem Exchange. So as you do start to write applications that can impact business, and you want Cisco's community to be actually using this, so our customers are using them, our partners are distributing them, we have something called Ecosystem Exchange, which is a place where you can go and post your applications as they get up to the level that they want to be distributed there, and then we can give you access to help in your business as well. And next is you can start now. We actually created at developer.cisco.com slash start now a set of learning labs that lets you get hands-on with each technology. All of these resources are free, so you can get in there and get hands-on with IoT, get hands-on with networking, get hands-on with Meraki, and you can start now. And I encourage you all to just get out there and start learning the areas that you want to do. So what we've talked about here overall is I hope that you see the opportunity and the excitement that we feel about the new types of applications that you all can build when working with a programmable infrastructure. There's a great set of opportunities with the network advances with Wi-Fi 6 and 5G, the compute advances with GPUs everywhere, from the servers all the way down to the, to the devices themselves, and the new architectures like edge computing that let developers reach into new areas. And we know that security is a really important area for all of you, but it's so hard to do. But you can let the infrastructure help you with security so that you can make sure that your customers and your businesses are secure. So next what I want to do is have a deep dive into Meraki. So Meraki is a tremendous product line that we have that provides a full set of connectivity and networking for a lot of the applications that you all want to build. And I'm pleased to have Todd Nightingale, the Senior Vice President, General Manager of Meraki, here on stage with us. Thank you, Todd. Thank you so much. Shouldn't Start Now be called Hello World, or does that date me? Uh, yeah. Um, look, I'm really honored to be here, and, and I really I do appreciate being asked. DevNet is, is so important to us, uh, but, but for all of you, I, I think you should know the DevNet team and, and Susie Wee, uh, they've built this thing from nothing. I, I was uh, lucky enough to be at the first ever DevNet created this tiny site up in San Francisco, and it has really, uh, it has really arrived. But, but more than that, that team really acts as the developer advocate within Cisco. At Cisco, we spend a lot of time thinking about what's next. What's next in the world of networking or infrastructure, or data center, or application development? And Susie and the DevNet team, they are in those discussions advocating for this community, for developers around the world being able to build on top of the technology we build. And I think that, more than anything, more than um, 
all of the new Wi-Fi 6 and the power of uh, compute and GPUs, that, that has changed Cisco, is to drive us and modernize our, our technology to be built into the applications and into the infrastructures that you're all building. So for that, I, I am grateful to the DevNet team, so thank you. Uh, my name's Todd, I look after the Meraki business here at Cisco, and our mission at Meraki is to simplify powerful technology so passionate people can focus on their true mission. And that is really near and dear to everything we do, and I think for a long time we believed that meant you know, building the most intuitive interface for our network operator, for our digital workplace team, for our uh, IT infrastructure uh, deployment groups. And that, that was great. We called that product Meraki Dashboard our, uh, our user interface. And I think it did differentiate us. It helped us build, uh, build a huge customer base and afford to make beautiful hardware. I, I, I do love uh, beautiful hardware. But um, about four years ago, we saw just, just the few little bits of API, of open platform we had, start being used by dramatically more people. And we saw the possibility of building far more sophisticated use cases if we opened our eyes beyond our own dashboard. Right? And it was, it was that point about four years ago that we took this massive pivot towards an open platform, towards an API first, an API driven architecture. Not to get away from this mission of simplicity, but to really deliver on it. Because the simplest way to manage one access point might be to log into the Meraki dashboard. And, uh, and I love the Meraki dashboard. Uh, but the simplest way to orchestrate 15,000 deployments across 10 countries, all simultaneously integrated into the rest of the apps and the data center and the cross-domain fabric, it might not be managing all of that from one UI. It might be true programmable network automation using APIs. And that use case is just so important to us. And, and the simplest way to deliver that is through API, through programmability. And, then, and there's really another piece too, which is this idea that there's a whole handful of applications that have nothing to do with network programmability or network automation or network engineering. They're about taking data from these interfaces, the intelligence, the information from the products we build, and using them to further the missions that our customers care about most. That's not about network engineering. It's about serving retail customers in a, in a better and more intuitive way, learning how restaurants can operate better and more effectively. It's about figuring out when the festival is out of beer, man. That was an awesome use case. I'm all about that. Um, and those applications, they're not going to be built by us. In fact, I think about how my team, how the Meraki group, how we build uh, products. We build products for all verticals. We build multi-purpose network infrastructure and IT infrastructure. We build cameras and Wi-Fi and routing and SD-WAN and security, and I love that stuff. But are we going to build the next great healthcare app? No. We do not build vertically specific uh, components of technology. In fact, we build a platform that's designed now, thanks to this API and open strategy, it's designed for your teams, for the development community to build and verticalize this, these products to build you know, industry-changing technology on top of this platform, on top of the Meraki APIs, on top of the entire DevNet API suite. And that's why this is so important to us. And I do think that that's why we've driven so much adoption here. Just a few years, we went from essentially no API adoption to 30 million calls a day, right? Yeah, thanks. I say, I say we, I say we, but I, I don't make any API calls every day. So you guys, uh, your teams are, 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 are driving this adoption. There's only, 6, 000, there's only 6 million or so Meraki hardware devices out in the world. But there's 30 million calls a day. It's really remarkable. And it means that this community, this developer community, might be the most important constituency 
when it comes to this uh, Meraki uh, industry change, this idea of driving towards simplicity. This mission of simplicity is fed as much as it is by my teams, it's fed by your teams. And that's why there's so many active users, more than 75,000 Meraki organizations, Meraki customer orgs, that call on the APIs every single day, right? Not just for network automation, but also for a whole host of vertical specific and application business value applications on top of this stuff. And there's a few I wanted to talk about in particular. Um, one is Desjardins Bank and, and Bell Canada. Desjardins is one of the biggest banks in Canada. Um, and they, they care quite a bit about having not just a financial, but also a social impact on their communities. It's why Desjardins takes so much care in the quality of their actual sites, of actual bank branches. And they were in the process of this massive transformation moving to a Meraki infrastructure in all of those banks. And their network automation team realized, I'm not, you know, I'm not configuring dozens or hundreds of sites, I'm talking about 1,200 bank branches and 2,200 switches being uh, transitioned over. And a bank, a financial institution like this, this is the kind of place where your site can't, you know, 95% work. If you're paying your mortgage, you want it to 100% work. And they really needed an ultra high SLA on this conversion, on this network uh, generation shift. And they leveraged the power of the cloud and zero touch deployment, et cetera, but they still felt like maybe there was a way to make it even easier for techs on site to do this operational change, right? And because of that, they built a really beautiful application to do this upgrade. It actually gave graphics to the installer that was generated live in order to tell exactly which cables to move where, exactly what to do as you step through each process of this transformation. And man, it makes me feel good that financial institutions are taking this extra care to make sure it is 100% uh, correct installation. And then when it is done and the installer certifies it as done, it is verified and checked 100% on the back end through these APIs and through the cloud. Right? Because this kind of thing, it matters enormously. And if you're going to manage five or 10 or 100 sites, great. But if you're going to do 1,200 sites or 12,000 sites, if you're a service provider and you're going to manage 150,000 sites, it's going to be through the APIs. It's going to be in an automated way, not just to increase the speed with which you do it, but to increase uh, the accuracy, to lower that chance of the uh, infamous fat finger. Um, and look, I, 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 I do love uh, banking, but maybe more than that, I, 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 I'm an eater. Uh, I am, I get it. And uh, I think Toast is, is a super interesting group. No one at Toast has ever talked about the next generation of network operation and network automation. Toast talks about what is the, what is the next generation of technology in restaurants. In fact, part of their mission is to turn guests into regulars. I love that. I think it's the waffles that turn guests into regulars, but maybe it's the technology, right? Um, and by combining front of the house and back of the house and point of sale technology, Toast does a, does a really great job of that. If you're at a restaurant and it feels like really next generation, the way they take your reservation, hold your reservation, seat you, take your orders, it might be because Toast is their back end. And they use Meraki extensively, right? When they uh, look at their analytics and how they uh, sense what's happening in the environment, how they set up and provision networks for their, um, for their restaurants, they're using Meraki equipment. In fact, the way they do it is by deploying one of the uh, secure SD-WAN routers, having it all provisioned and configured simply, and then as they monitor the environment, they're doing it, they're not just monitoring the network, they're monitoring holistically the restaurant, the point of sale terminals, and all of the technology together, all of the toast technology, of which Meraki is part. That is like the perfect example of like a real verticalization uh, of our technology. I don't need, and I hope that those restaurants never know that they're using Cisco or Meraki technology. Maybe I hope that, it would be cool. They could put the Wi-Fi up like so I could see it when I walk in. Um, but they, they, what they know is that they're using best-in-class restaurant platform from Toast 
and that they get a single dashboard and a single status and a single experience for them and for their diners, and it comes because the Toast engineering team has been able, through DevNet, to operate fully programmatically and, and fully behind the scenes through the APIs. Like that, man, that is the dream. And we can do this kind of transformation across all of these industries. On Cisco's side, by really investing in full programmability in an API first strategy led by Susie and team and from all of you. So thank you for the, these types of solutions. I do really want to thank the, the developer community. So cheers. And, and Susie is the first person to tell me the way to thank the developer community is to give them back stuff, to give them more APIs and more support and more documentation and more events like this. And, and that's why I'd like to ask Shay, Shay to come up, Shay Chen, and, and help me uh, talk about some of the newest, some of the newest uh, parts of the Meraki API and DevNet Meraki uh, uh, solution. Uh, the first one, while, uh, while Shay is getting ready here, the first one is certainly the DevNet uh, Developer Hub. So we will now have a fully dedicated developer hub for Meraki APIs that, of course, work, as we saw before, with all the umbrella and all the rest of the Cisco APIs. But that developer hub, um, it's really going to be the nexus for all Meraki developer information. And we are going to be pushing all of our, what used to be called Meraki.io, all of our Meraki developer uh, community and community information into that group. Uh, so we're super excited about that, and I think finally we're gonna be like a full-fledged DevNet member. I'm excited, so that's awesome. Um, okay, great, yes, I'm sure it's exciting. Um, and, and there's a handful of developer pieces that I, I think are, are super interesting. Um, can we go to the... Yeah, can we get the... Yeah, the this is the developer hub. It's beautiful, look at it, it's glorious, yeah. Uh, I love it. Uh, and I think maybe the most interesting piece here um, isn't just that you'll, uh, you'll have all the information and all the code samples and everything we talked about. It's that it's in the same place as all your other DevNet stuff. It's a single point of contact. And it will be the source for all new news and information. So Susie said, the best developers in the world, they know where to get the code. This is where to get the code. Um, the next piece is the Open API uh, specification, Open API initiative which I think is a, a really important way for us to try to accelerate development and, and adoption of, uh, of our code, our APIs, into, into your tools. And this is an awesome thing. I'm sure most of the developers in the room are already familiar, but we'll be essentially publishing all the API schema and internal documentation through the API, open API standard, and thereby in your developer tool, you can pull all of that in automatically and have our API documentation in your tools embedded within uh, in the schema, and it is, it is super powerful, um, and, and the open API folks did a great job in standardizing this and uh, spreading it through the industry. What do you think, Shay? I think it's also very important to announce that with this open API spec, what that means is uh, you get uh, documentation uh, day one, right? So when engineering releases something uh, very cool, you see it here, and this is actually uh, our new documentation. What do you even do with an API and no documentation? I don't know. Um, but yes, absolutely. You, you get the API with the documentation embedded and pulled directly into your tool set, right? What's next? What's new? So with this developer hub, uh, as I mentioned, we're releasing documentation here uh, in an interactive way. And what that means is you can actually come in here and do live try it now functionality. So you can come in here and put in your API key and be able to uh, very quickly run API calls right here in your browser without any applications or software. That is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah. And I think, look, there, there's, a, there's a handful of other new stuff. Um, and I, I'll go through some of my favorites, but, uh, and, and Shay will too. But, um, I have one that I think is incredibly important. So I think because of the success of, these, uh, of this API suite and, and the way it's being used on, on both sides, the application side and the uh, automation side, uh, I get by far, by far, I get one uh, complaint of the Meraki APIs more than any other, and that is that power users of the API run into the API per second call limit. Uh, so this is a real problem. And, and the reason this pops up is uh, we've got massive service providers, massive enterprise accounts 
that aren't managing you know, one network or a th even a thousand networks, they're managing hundreds of thousands of networks. Their own customers, they're managing these networks uh, and, and, and they're doing it in a very prescriptive way. When we launched wireless health APIs in particular, people wanted to do live, real-time monitoring the wireless health of these environments and that caused a ton of calls to be made, sometimes you know, many per org. And so we've launched something called action ba batching um, into the uh, API suite. Do you want to explain action batching? Yeah, sure. So action batches is a way to very quickly um, make one single API call that calls a bunch of other API endpoint resources. Uh, so here's an example of what we're announcing today. Uh, the Meraki API engineering team has uh, released action batches, and what this will allow you to do is touch multiple endpoints like VLAN, switch ports, devices, uh, and group policies, all with possibly a single API endpoint, uh, API call, and we'll show that very shortly here in the demo. Okay, awesome, awesome. So it's time, man. You can, we cannot put it off any longer. If you're gonna launch uh, new products and, and, and new APIs, you should, you should show it to the people. So um, we've got this small stack of gear right here. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a full stack. This, white, this is what might be in one of those toast restaurants. It's also, strangely, exactly what I run in my house, um, which is exciting. Um, and it comes complete with a Meraki camera, our, our newest product line, the MV12. Uh, what are we gonna do here, Shay? Yeah, so I was a little surprised earlier, Todd, when you say you've never made uh, an API call or you don't make an API call out of the 30 million every day because that's what we're going to do, Todd. Okay, I'm excited. I, I, I'll um, work hard. I'll, I'll work gonna, better. Yeah. What we're going to do is we're going to build um, this organization right here, right? So let me go ahead and refresh the screen and show you, oh, what, what happened? Well, the world map, uh, the colors are all gone just because uh, we, we actually reset this a few minutes ago. <laughs> we're going to build this live. Uh, with all of you here joining us. So we have, like I said, one stack. This is a real Mission Impossible moment, Shay. I'm excited. <laughs> we have a stack of gear right here um, on the stage. We also have six stacks of gear you can play with in the Meraki corner outside. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use our APIs, um, in this case, with our uh, open API spec, we're able to do code generation SDKs. Uh, and, uh, so we have Python, Ruby, Node.js available. And in this case, we're using the Python library to call the Meraki APIs and automate the whole provisioning of this organization. Uh, so Todd, what- it's, al it's, al it's almost like we have thousands and thousands of uh, sites around the world and we need to do this as fast as possible, right? Exactly. Yep. Um, so I don't know if you know this, Todd, what's the first step in making a Meraki API call? I'm gonna say API key, for API sure. API key. Yeah, got right it, because it's all about security, Shay. So let me go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you know this, Shay, but it's all about security. <laughs> so let me go ahead and generate an API key. You can see that uh, I just generated a new key. Um, I already had one before, and now I have two. It's kind of like you know your home key, have an extra spare one in case you get locked out. The guest right? key situation, I'm with you. Uh, and then I'm gonna do is copy that API key into my source code, and then going back to the live code gen, I can come in here, put in that API key, and get the organization ID of our demo uh, network here. So looks like uh, the demo gods, as Ashosh was saying here, wasn't looking um, after us. Um, luckily, I have this saved. Uh, <laughs> so nice. we'll use that for now. Are you live, really prepared for that? I appreciate that. Li live demo, right? <laughs> live demo. Um, so now that we have our API key, uh, what do you want to do next, Todd? Uh, I think it's time to put the devices into the org. So the way Meraki networks work is normally I would buy this equipment, I'd might, maybe I'd get a single PO with you know, these six sites worth of equipment all in it, and I'd be able to import that PO number or the individual serial numbers into the Meraki org, and then organize them into the different networks where I'm gonna deploy them. And I could do that clicking through Meraki dashboard. Exactly, yeah, so you can see here, I'm gonna run this script here, and what this will do is create uh, our networks, right? These are network containers with a Meraki cloud managed paradigm, that means you can pre-provision uh, your networks and devices before anything has even sh uh, been shipped and potentially been installed. So going back to dashboard now, if I refresh, you'll see that we should have a couple of networks um, here in Mountain View, for example, and going to uh, the Mountain View network, we see we have security appliance, SD-WAN, switch, wireless camera, and things like the time zone set, right? Pretty simple at this point. Uh, and this was all built on that one bit of Python code. This is using, uh, in this case, again, the Python SDK that's generated. Yeah, give it a minute, man. Look at that. This is beautiful code. Way to go. Uh, Thank you. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm a developer, Shay, and I just wish I could get this code, how would I get it? 
Uh, so this will be available on Code Exchange. Okay, awesome. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. All right. Uh, so I've imported all my devices. I've separated them out into my different sites. That's all been organized based on you know the data that my develop my deployment team gave me. What's next? Yeah, so now we're actually going to add some of those devices, right? So we haven't added the devices just yet. I'm calling another um, part of the script that now adds these devices. You can see here we've added a bunch of devices in Mountain View. If I go back into our dashboard and go to the appliance status page, you can see we have, in this case, uh, our MX that's sitting right here on stage. It's coming online. We have the address filled in. Of course, you know, we're here at the Computer History Museum. Wow. You, you really had a rich data set here. You got our address and everything. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, nice. N not only that, they know about you, Todd. So uh, they have some notes in here. If there's a problem with installation. Oh, they're going to call my. They're going to call my cell. Is that yeah. what we're talking they about? They know who to Great. call. Well, I'm glad we kept the phone numbers out of it. Uh, in addition, we're also using the new action batch endpoint that you mentioned to configure, um, in this case, the device uplink uh, interfaces, right? So this is um, the action batch call to configure two devices in this case. It could might as well have been 200 or you know, many more, uh, but it's one single API call that allows us to very quickly set the static IPs or the management IP addresses. Awesome. Um, so going back to uh, the script here, you can see that we've done all of uh, the device information. Um, at this point, I think we probably want a little bit more uh, settings, would you say, Todd, because... Well, we've set up the network, but we haven't really made it do anything powerful exactly, yet, Exactly, right? right. How am I going to get on the Wi-Fi? Yeah, so we have this uh, default name here, Mountain View Wireless. We want to name a little, something a little bit... You know, more, more That's fun. No, no fun. Let's go ahead and uh, go ahead and create um, and uh, call the next part of the script, which actually configure a bunch more settings. This again takes advantage of this new action batch functionality. Uh, so you can see here we're configuring multiple things: group policies, VLANs, uh, switch ports, all with a single um, endpoint. So now I can show you that if we go to the VLANs, uh, group policies, and switch ports, our MX has these VLANs created. It's like an enterprise network now. You're, you're, you're making it. You've segmented the, uh, you've set, segmented network traffic. You've managed data and voice on the separate networks and isolated guests. It's very professional. It's all about security. I like it. Yeah. I do have that at home. I'm very proud of that. That I've made. That, that, I have segmented my network. We also have a group policy for you, Todd. So this executive policy you can see here, uh, we have unlimited bandwidth, right? So you're not hindered by anything on the network. You have proper oh, I do POS enjoy special treatment. I, uh, for, for your WebEx meetings. Uh, but if some you know, random guest were to connect on the network, you'll see that they have uh, bandwidth limits. They're denied from using peer-to-peer -peer and other applications using the Meraki Layer 7 application visibility. Awesome, awesome. Uh, switch ports as well. Now, going back to that wireless, right? So I mentioned that uh, we wanted to change this name of the SSID. So um, if I refresh this page here, you'll see that we actually have uh, the SSID properly set now, right? So Code monkey, get up, get coffee, great. Loving it. That's yeah. correct. Uh, this you're, should be you're really in the zeitgeist here. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, this, this SSID is actually broadcasting from the AP, and if, uh, if you guys uh, pull out your phones, you'll be able to see this SSID. Not a great time to pull out your phones. We're right in the middle <laughs> of the presentation. But I assure you, like, please check it out. It's not just this stack of networking gear up here. It's the networking stacks all across um, uh, all across the site here, and so you can get onto the uh, Get Monkey, uh, the Code Monkey uh, SSID across uh, DevNet Create today. Yeah, and of course, because we're talking about Code Monkey, we have to you know create a absolutely uh, a splash login page, right? Uh, that people can join. Do I want to know? No. <laughs> if you guys don't get the reference, uh, look up the Code Monkey uh, music video on YouTube. Great. So let's wrap up this demo, Todd, and actually create some fun, right, uh, as part of DevNet Create. And what we're going to do is, as part of um, our APIs, not only can you do things like configure networks and add devices and, uh, in this case, uh, build a full enterprise network across the world, we can also create some fun. And what I'm going to do is, if you guys can see in the front, we're blinking the lights of all the devices, not just here in the room, but around all of our networks, potentially around the world, Todd. No, no, nothing says fun like blinking lights. That's, uh, that's glorious. Um, and, and, and the blinking lights on your uh, devices, that, that's an amazing uh, automation story because you have to connect not just the Meraki devices, but the devices around the environment. I think this is going to be the power of opening up Meraki APIs is allowing us, it's freaking me out, all the uh, necklaces. <laughs> um, 
It's going to allow us to build in real experiences where the network reacts to the site and the network operates as part of a bigger set of infrastructure, uh, probably not flashing net necklaces. Um, at Meraki, we really believe in, in this idea of building these platforms beyond the network. It's why we've launched a portfolio across the whole digital workplace. After networking and security, we've moved in now to mobile device management and finally cameras. And so the APIs extend to these cameras uh, to, in the Meraki portfolio. And you can see our fun script didn't just uh, blink the lights. It also took pictures of all of you, post them to a WebEx Teams room, and now you've all been recorded as part of this presentation. Congratulations. Uh, Thank so you so much to the production team in the back and all of you as willing participants in our API experiment. Yeah, and thank you, Shay. Thanks. And, uh, and look, I do think this is really core to our strategy, not just at Meraki, but across all of uh, Cisco's portfolios, is developing important APIs that your teams will not just want to use, but really need to use to build the application experiences you want, making them incredibly available. Uh, using DevNet and building in the uh, enablement along with the uh, Cisco DevNet team to build the best community of developers on top of this platform. 585,000 is just the beginning. So thank you so much. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thanks, Todd. Awesome. New APIs released here at DevNet Create. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Shay. Good job. <laughs> And was I right? Did you guys like seeing the real code in action? Yeah, excellent. All right, so now to bring it home in the keynote so that you can get to the next stage. But first, what we want to do is Mandy and I, whoop. Let's see. OK, let me get to the right spot. Here we go. So uh, Mandy and I want to represent our some award winners that we've had. So those of you who were at DevNet Create last year, know that we created a DevNet Creator Award. And this is members of our community who have contributed so much to other community members and to the community overall. Now, last year, we had five new DevNet Creators. And I just want to say that three of our creators are actually showing up on, De on DevNet at blogs.cisco.com slash developer. And we have a developer spotlight that's actually showing off some of the contributions and achievements from these last year's award winners. Jeff, Jeff Levensailer. Where are you, Jeff? Stand up. Woo! There he is. Oh, he's yeah, always standing in the, in the back. back. <laughs> Paul Giblin. Paul. There's Paul. He may and be coding. Jose Bogarin. So Jose. thank you all. Woo! <laughs> thank you, guys. So you can go online, and what we're doing is following the impact that they've had as they've been learning new skills, as they've been developing and pushing new technologies into their organizations and making change and helping the community, helping all of you back. And now what we're excited to do is to represent and bring up this year's award winners. So we're going to now have our Community Contribution Awards, our new DevNet creators. Are we ready to go, Mandy? We're ready. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to have each award winner come up on stage, and I'm going to embarrass them a little bit and say what they've done, and then we'll take some pictures. You guys ready? Yes. All right, here's our DevNet creator. So our very first DevNet creator, Andra Ellert. Woo! Come on up. Come up around over here. <laughs> Thank you. Congrats. Okay, okay you got to come you stand stay here. right here yep, while I read here. a little bit about what you've done, Andra. <laughs> so Andra has been the cornerstone of the DevNet community in Germany. So she led the first partner DevNet Express at Dimension Data. She works at Dimension Data. She's been a true innovator in terms of leveraging DevNet to start a network programmability practice within Dimension Data. And thank you for embracing DevNet and then showing us new ways to help network engineers embrace automation. And so it's an honor and privilege to represent and give you the <laughs> <laughs> DevNet Creator Award. <laughs> Woo! Thank you. And so we're going to take a Thank picture. Thank you. Are going to take a picture? Ready? <laughs> 
Thank you. Thank you. Stand. So you're going to stand over there because we're going to get everybody up. Excellent. Okay. Great. Next. Yeah. Absolutely. The, clicker. the clicker's there. Okay. Uh, I'm excited to announce our next DevNet Creator Award winner is Ken Partridge. Ken, can Ken. you come on up? <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. Give it a hug. Or? Thank you. Congratulations. Okay. So Ken Partridge is a principal engineer at Western Telematic. He was at DevNet Create last year. And this is a really cool story because I love how it shows one create to the next create. He was here last year. He came to John McDonough's um, How to Contribute to Ansible session. And he learned new skills. He took it back to his organization. He got them building um, Ansible playbooks and modules. And act they actually were able to upstream some code into Ansible 2.7. So that was a really great um, example of taking new ideas from a conference, making change in your organization. And that is not easy to do. So um, it is an honor and a privilege to present you with your 2019 DevNet Creator Award. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. All right. OK. You guys ready for another ready? winner? <clears throat> yes. Our next one is Maybelline Pletchett. Congratulations. <laughs> All right. So Maybelline is leading many efforts within Presidio uh, to help engineers learn new skills and join the DevNet community. So she actually started and leads the Presidio DevNet Women's Study Group, many of who are here. Woo! <laughs> and they're participating. You guys are participating in Camp Create, so they are coding away. And she conducts a weekly one-hour coding session every Monday. And it was to get people into the habit of coding. So that was just brilliant when she came up with that. And we've seen this group grow and deepen their skills throughout the years. So Maybelline, thank you for all of your contributions to the community. And it's an honor to give you this award. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Next up. Our next DevNet Creator Award winner is Joel King. <laughs> Joel. Come on up. Woo! So, <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Joel King has been a DevNet community member and guest blogger since 2014, so since the very beginning. Um, he, is, he has recent work to create an Ansible plus Tetration project that he published in DevNet Code Exchange. He also spent a lot of time guest blogging about that project and really help, helping people understand how to use those two technologies together. And that was a huge contribution to the community to help people get started. So it is an honor and a privilege to present you with your 2019 DevNet Creator Award. Excellent. All right. OK. Are we ready? Our next and our final DevNet Creator Award goes to Stephen Welch. Stephen. Woo! Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. All right. You got to stand here and hear your story. So. <laughs> Steven is a founder and CTO, er, is a founder and CTO at Unified FX. So he is very active in our community and the WebEx team's chat room, and he helps people out with those tough, difficult questions. And many people are willing to help, but what Steven does is he stays there till the very end until every person's problem is solved. And you guys know that's a hard thing to do. Um, <laughs> so Steven, thank you for your participation with DevNet. And it's an honor for us to be giving you the DevNet Creator Award. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. All right. So now let's get a picture, picture with all of our the whole DevNet group creators. 2019 <laughs> group of DevNet Creators.
Great. All right. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank All you. All right. And once again, I just want to represent that really DevNet is all about the community. And I want to thank you all because it's really what you are all providing for each other and how you're helping each other and really making all of the advances and taking the most of the opportunities we have in front of us. So now what we're going to do is Mandy's going to close off and she is going to talk to us now about the things that you'll see at the rest of DevNet Create for these next two days. So yes. go ahead, Mandy, bring thank it home. Thank you. So just a couple slides to highlight a few of the things going on today and to get ready for a few things tomorrow. So first of all, you can scan this QR code. You can go to this agenda URL. The agenda is mobile friendly, so you can see all the sessions happening. And if you join DevNet, you can actually bookmark the sessions you want to go to and build out your own agenda. We also have a membership gift for all of you that are already DevNet members or new people who join while you're here. You can stop by the info desk and pick up your membership gift. So don't forget to do that. Some of the things that are going on, we've got tech talks. We have two classrooms going on, plus a whole um, area of lightning talks going on. And these cover things like DevSecOps, security, API design, and developer experience best practices. Some of the things we talked about this morning around edge compute, ML, automation. So check it out. There's a lot of talks going on. They're all listed in that agenda. We also have some hands-on challenges going on. So one is that you can test drive Wi-Fi 6, be some of the first people to try it out. You can take the Meraki challenge, where you will actually sit down and start from scratch and just deploy a Meraki stack like that and get, be able to get hands-on with Meraki. And then we also have the IoT and ML at the edge prototype that we've been talking about. Workshops. We heard you. Last year, we heard you wanted more of the hands-on workshops. So we have six workshop stations going continuously throughout the day. You can sit down and code, or you can stand around and listen. These are covering a lot of the topics that may also be covered in a tech talk, but you can go deeper and get hands-on in the workshop. And then for community and fun, really important part of a conference. I challenge all of you to leave here knowing more people than you did when you came. So if you already know 10 people in the DevNet community that are here, you need to meet 11 new people at least. That's your goal. Um, and one great way to do this is, do you guys know about the Pac-Man rule for conferences? Anyone? So you know when you're standing in the hallway and everybody's standing in a perfect circle like this, right? And it's really hard for a new person to break into that circle, especially if you're a little bit shy, like I kind of am. So if everyone can just think to stand in a Pac-Man shape, leaving that one space open so someone can easily join in, that's a great way to be able to invite new people into conversations. So use the Pac-Man rule. Notice when you're standing in those, in those shapes. Another important thing that we are doing is we're doing some research with you, our community. We want to hear your voices. We want to hear how you want to see DevNet grow. And so we have some research teams here who will be doing some interviews, gathering feedback. They're going to have on um, special shirts. You can find them. They're in maroon right here on the front stage. Um, and so feel free to engage in those conversations and, and let us know how DevNet can help you and what's going on in your careers. At the end of each day, we have a closing session. And this is a really important part of a community conference. It's when we all get back together at the end of the day, and we are going to invite you to come up and say what you learned during the day. So if you were in a really cool session, you can talk about it. You can say some of the things that really stood out to you. We'll have some fun prizes. We're also going to have a raffle. You can get an iPad, some Bose headphones, or a cool Amazon gift card. So you have to be here at the closing ceremony to win those prizes. Um, and we also wrote a really cool raffle application that you'll get to see, um, which makes the raffle really fun. And then Create After Dark. That's our party today out in the garden. Um, we're going to have full food. Um, you don't need to go anywhere else for dinner. We have a full dinner, and it's going to be a really great time to connect and celebrate. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention is design thinking. We have a des design thinking booth. This is a really interactive, fun place to go and meet with the team. So stop by that booth. You can't miss it. It has all the sticky notes and fun colors. And uh, they're going to be talking about when design me thinking meets Wi-Fi 6 and what are those some of the possibilities that come up. 
Camp Create, we've talked a lot about it. Um, they're over by the classrooms. If you see those desks of people concentrated, working really hard, those are the Camp Create people. And feel free to visit with them during the conference and hear about the, the projects that they're building and things like that. And we want to thank Presidio for sponsoring Camp Create this year. So yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> Something new that we're doing this year, um, this is going to happen tomorrow during this morning keynote session, and it's called Connect to Create. And this is where we want to give you a chance to talk with each other about topics that you suggest. So we're going to have a place in the design thinking workshop where you can suggest topics for tomorrow. And then tomorrow during part of this morning session, we'll be in here and we'll break into small groups, and you can actually go from group to group discuss on the topics you're interested in, and then we'll read out and share with the group. So if you have ideas or if you want to lead a discussion, go put some suggestions up in the design thinking booth, and we'll have that session tomorrow. Um, and then Create After Dark. Celebrate with us tonight. Like I said, there is a full dinner. Big shout out. Um, thank you, Cisco Meraki, for sponsoring the Create After Dark party tonight. And we are... We are going to have some very, very cool light-up glasses. And I'm there. You're, it's going to be amazing to see them. So, so come to see that. And then thank you to all of you, our community, our speakers, our staff, our sponsors, everyone who makes this possible. We really appreciate it. All right. Go out and create. <laughs>